the Sultan Library, the two young people overdosed on the synthetic marijuana known as spice. It's a drug that, while not illegal, causes seizures, it can cause hallucinations, and it can cause vomiting. But the drug problem along Highway 2 goes far beyond spice. Uh, the Snohomish County Tribune newspaper recently reported the number of substance abuse calls and thefts in the first six months of this year was seven to eight times higher than the previous year. And according to the police, most of the thefts committed to, in, in the area are committed to fuel a heroin habit. And of all the substance abuse calls related to heroin, high, high school girls are reportedly using heroin as a weight loss drug. Drug-related hospital admissions have skyrocketed into, in, in the area. Heroin and other illegal drugs are taking a toll on the health and security of all of our communities. There is no Mayberry anymore. Uh, the, the Opie is, is probably a user if not a dealer these days. And, and that's why we are here tonight. So we can understand the extent of the drug problem along Highway 2 and we can share ideas for reducing the toll that drugs are taking. We're going to hear some opening remarks from our distinguished panelists this evening and then I will ask some questions and you are encouraged to ask questions tonight. And if, if you're following on Twitter, you're welcome to answer quest ask questions as well. We will get those questions to the panelists. And, and when it does come time for the questions, I will ask those of you who have questions to raise your hands. We'll send a microphone to you and we will get that question asked and answered to the best of our ability this evening. And if you would identify yourself, if you would identify any specific organization that you belong to, um, we would be very happy to have that information as well. Tonight, on our panel, we have Detective David Chitwood of the Snohomish Regional Drug and Gang Task Force and Bart Wheaton, Chemical Dependency Counselor with Catholic Community Services and the Cocoon House. And I'm going to ask each of them to begin our presentation this evening with a statement, and then we will get to the more important aspect, which I think is your questions and their answers. And I think we will begin with Detective David Chitwood. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Uh, again, I'm Detective Chitwood with the Snohomish Regional Drug and Gang Task Force. I've been in law enforcement uh, for about 22 years. My career started uh, in the city of Lake Forest Park. I was there from 92 to 99, <clears throat> excuse me. And then it uh, came on a ride along with a deputy in Snohomish County and said, I gotta go work there. So I came here in 99 and uh, love it been here ever since. Um, currently right now, I, I am a deputy with the Sheriff's Office and I am assigned to the Drug Task Force. In Snohomish County, the Drug Task Force is a regional, multi-jurisdictional task force. So we serve all of Snohomish County. And it's kind of like a one-stop shop. We've got detectives that do mid to upper level cases. We've got prosecutor, uh, criminal prosecutor assigned from the prosecutor's office. Uh, we've got a secretary for her, we've got lieutenants, uh, we have the health department, we have CPS assigned to our office. So we have lots of options and lots of uh, ability to, to do our job. So it's, it's actually, it's kind of crazy to think that we have such a big task force in Snohomish County, but it, it is nice to have all those entities in there. Um, and if you think about it, with Highway 2, with I-5, with the waterway, with the airway, the railway, we've got a lot of different ways that drugs come into our community. So, you know, unfortunately, that's why we need such a big task force here. So it's actually, it's good to have what we have here. So um, part of what my job is, the task force obviously is a bunch of undercover detectives doing mid to upper level cases. My job is to do street level drug stuff and to to uh, work on drug houses. I also work on our website, I work on our Facebook page, I go and talk at community events like this, in schools, for education, I talk to parents about what is drug paraphernalia. People hear about drug paraphernalia, they hear about heroin, I, I show them pictures, I show them what paraphernalia is, what is drug paraphernalia, what goes along with heroin, what goes along with crack and stuff. So for me, I can get out in public and be seen like this, where the other detectives, obviously, their job is to, to blend in and, and be undercover. So 
um, yeah, I think that's all I can tell you about me right now. My name is Bart Wheaton. I'm a chemical dependency counselor for uh, Catholic Community Services. Um, I work uh, out of the cocoon house currently. I've been um, working as a chemical dependency counselor for Catholic Community Services for this is my fifth year. Um, I have been uh, working with cocoon for the last two years. And when working with the cocoon, is it's, it's a little uh, more at risk youth, um, more at risk for. Uh, uh, criminal activity, more at risk for um, homelessness, and um, just more at risk youth. Um, when working with uh, the youth, I um, frequently have to work with um, agencies like schools and um, parents, and uh, also um, work with the police and probation departments. So um, a lot of times, I guess the biggest um, question I would get from most parents and most um, people from just the community asking me about my job um, would be, the, I guess the biggest question would be um, about how to tell if your kid's doing drugs. And the, I think the second biggest question is, um, or one of the, the people don't understand about addiction is it's, they, they believe it's a choice. They believe that if the, the youth would just choose not to use drugs, everything would be better. Um, but what I understand about drug addiction and what I've learned is um, it's a disease and it's a disease of the mind and um, it's identified as a disease by the ASAM criteria as well yeah. as um, AMA, American Medical Association. So. Um, a lot of times, a lot of the questions I, I will um, answer about uh, drug addiction will be just simply, why can't a person stop? And um, a lot of times that's, that's a tough question to, to ask, cause, uh, especially with the at-risk youth that I, that I do work with. Um, a lot of those kids have uh, um, addiction-affected families that um, so in the early age they're exposed to um, drug addiction and, and uh, alcoholism. And I also um, the moderator there, he had said, you know, the heroin and methamphetamines and all those drugs, but since uh, our state has uh, put alcohol into grocery stores, that has, um, there's been a big up uh, spike of uh, alcohol poisoning because of that harder alcohol readily available to youth that, that steal it out of the grocery stores and so I mean that's another um, issue that, that I think a lot of people don't think about so um, is alcohol poisoning I know that I talk to people at the hospital and they say that has been on the rise a lot of kids coming in for alcohol poisoning so um, I'd be more than happy to answer any of those questions um, if you'd like. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, again, our panelists, Detective David Chitwood of the Snohomish Regional Drug and Gang Task Force and Bark Wheaton, Chemical Dependency Counselor, Catholic Community Services of the Cocoon House. And if uh, you have some questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask them. I will uh, exercise the moderator's prerogative and ask the first question. Um, and this one for um, for uh, Detective Chitwood, when you started 22 years ago, what, what were the f primary crimes of youth that you were dealing with? W was the crime of illegal drug use, alcohol abuse, as high on your list as it is now, 22 years ago when you started? I think it was just starting, but I came from the city of Lake Forest Park in King County, if you guys know where that's at. So it was a different kind of activity there. Uh, cocaine, a little bit of heroin and pills, marijuana. Um, it just wasn't, it wasn't as big as it, it is now here. It did, we didn't have a high, we don't have a high school. They had an uh, elementary school in Lake Forest Park. Uh, the closest high school I think was Bothell and then maybe up by maybe Shoreline High School. So we didn't have the kids 
in the community like this or like in Gold Bar or like in Stanwood that's got the high schools and stuff. So it's a different, that's a tough question for me because it was different there. So it's de I definitely see a lot more, a lot more kids using and willing to try stuff than I did in Lake Forest Park 22 years ago. And, and um, for, uh, for you, Bart, with the kids that you deal with, the, the, the kids that you talk with and, and, and deal with, what do they tell you about how they got involved with drugs and when they started? I think the most common um, reason I hear is peer pressure. Um, friends will have, have um, they'll have been around somebody else that was using the drug and asked them to use it. And, and what, what is it that, that doesn't allow them to say no? I, that's, I think that would be better asked as teenage development a person that knows teenage development and, and how kids really want to fit in. I mean, I don't know if you guys were teenagers, you were in high school, right? Right? That's, that's a tough gig. I mean, that's a, I would never want to relive those times in my life again. So, uh, I mean, really, you know, that, that need to, to want to connect and to want to fit in. And, and, and are you seeing an involvement at a younger age? Uh, or is it fairly consistent? It's, it's fairly consistent. Usually um, the age of first use roughs around eighth or ninth grade. And the, so that would be 12, 13, 14 years old? 13 to 14, like 14, yeah. 12, 13, 14, yeah. And it generally starts with peers, not in the home? Um, no, that's not true, because a lot of uh, uh, kids, especially the kids I work with today out of Cocoon, they do, um, there is a lot of exposure to drugs and alcohol in the home. But, I mean, kids like, uh, I worked out at uh, IOP group in Marysville, which is a, is a kind of a rural area, and those kids certainly would, um, would uh, the main reason was peer pressure out there. And uh, we're having this forum here and the opportunity for you to ask questions as well. If anyone has a question for either of our panelists, please raise your hand and let us know that you uh, have that question. We'll get a microphone over to you and uh, give you the opportunity to get that, that question asked. So please don't hesitate to raise your hand if you have uh, questions for tonight. Uh, let me put this question to both of you. We know that there's a genetic link for alcoholism. And we also know that the single largest influence on kids is their parents. Is the dynamic going to change? What do you think the impact is going to be now that the recreational use of marijuana in Washington is legal? Do you see it having a significant change in drug usage, numbers in the, in the county as a result of it being made legal. Uh, detective? I don't, I don't think it's going to help. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, parents now, you talk to your kids about drinking and driving, you talk to your kids about drugs, you talk to your kids about bullying, uh, we talk to our kids about not lying and using bad language and stuff. Now we have to talk to our kids about when they go to the neighbor's house, who they've been playing with for the last five years, if they pull out a joint or a bong and they start smoking a substance, please come home and don't hang out there. It's another conversation that we have to have with kids. Some parents are going to choose to smoke in their house and smoke marijuana, and, and that's fine if that's what they choose to do because it's legal in the state of Washington and the voters approved it. But as parents that are against that, we have to talk to our kids and let them know, listen, this is what marijuana looks like. This is part of the paraphernalia that goes along with it. If for some reason you're at a friend's house or you're at a gathering and their parents or their brother or sister or whoever pulls it out and starts smoking this, we want you to come home or give us a call and we'll come and get you. And then that's a place that I know that my kids will not go back there. So I think it just is more conversation that we have to have with the stuff like drinking and driving when they're in driver's ed and that type of stuff. Yeah, I, um, I think the kids that are uh, predisposition to kind of have a problem with drugs or alcohol, I don't think it'll affect, I think those kids would have a problem with drugs or alcohol without that legalization. I mean, I, like you said, I don't think it will help. I think that I, I talked to a kid from 
um, this community and asked him where he got his marijuana and he told me he got it from uh, a guy that has a medical marijuana card that goes up to a dispensary right down the road here and buys it for him. So, Would the, the kids that you have that conversation with, your, your children, and you say if you're over at a friend's house and they pull out a bong and they start lighting up, is that a, a, a conversation that is going to be unique to this drug? You wouldn't have that conversation if they were over there and they pulled out a beer to have a beer, <coughs> poured themselves a cocktail? Is it, is it a unique conversation? I think so. Secondhand smoke, the issues of that. I mean, I, I, I would think that parents would talk to their kids about the same thing. Hey, if you're over at Jimmy's house and Jimmy's parents are drinking and they're, you know, using bad language, stumbling around, any, showing effects like that, being disruptive, I guess you would have that conversation. Did I answer your question right? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I'm trying to think if I had that conversation, I'm not really sure, but I, I would like to hope that I did. And again, if you have questions this afternoon, please, we have a question in the back. Please stand up and identify yourself. Hi, my name is Donna Noble. I live in Marysville, and I'm a student support advocate in Grand Falls School District. So um, this question is directed to Bart. So Bart, with the um, kids that you're seeing, um, and this is something that I've experienced is that kids are getting clean from the harder drugs and meth and the heroin and things like that, but they're still um, using marijuana to the point where it would be deemed that they're dependent, but they're not looking at it in light that it's that bad because, I mean, obviously if they're addicted and using the her heroin and meth, they're not doing that anymore, but they're still smoking um, and they don't look at it like it's a big deal or it's disrupting their life and it helps them to focus and stay calm and things like that. Can you address that as far as um, in your role and what you know and how that's going to impact them and sure. the clean and non-clean type thing? Sure, yeah, and that does happen quite a bit. And I think um, another thing um, needs to be said about that legalization, uh, because what that does do, and that's a part of the conversation I think Detective Chitwa was talking about, is um, it normalizes marijuana and normalizes marijuana use. So uh, a youth might think now, it's legal. It's it's harmless. So which I mean, alcohol's legal, but it still can cause harm too. So I think it's, that's just uh, part of the conversation, like Detective Chitwood said. But so my experience with um, uh, youth that are trying to uh, get off heroin and trying to uh, uh, get off methamphetamines and using marijuana, that's a very common thing that happens actually. Um, what they will do is it stimulates the same parts of the brain uh, marijuana does. So it's just a matter of time before they go back to those drugs. Any other questions? I yes. Uh, I guess I'm let's wait. Just wait for the microphone. Please stand up and identify yourself. My name is Monica Stedman. I'm a social worker and um, have worked at Providence for several years and now I'm an independent clinical social worker. Um, I would beg to differ, I guess, about um, that kids aren't using the methamphetamine, the opiates. Um, I think that what I'm seeing or what I have seen is, is that they're just going straight to the heroin. It's um, yeah. they don't have the That's money to spend eighty dollars on a pill, or you know, and so, and also the age group. Um, my I have three boys. My youngest um, is going into sixth grade. Sorry, I have three boys. My youngest is going into sixth grade, and um, I ask him, you know, when he's at the skate park, have you been approached? And several times he talks about it and. And working within um, the pediatric unit, I, you know, the age group I'm saying is lower than, or, yeah, lower than. I'm talking about kids school. that would have to come in and see me for an assessment. The age group of those kids, not age group of kids that will be approached. I'm sure those kids that see me for assessments usually right around age 13 or 14 is initial. I mean, every once in a while I'll get one as young as 12, but um, never younger than that. Interesting. Thank you. And there was a question in the back. Uh, 
Hi, I'm uh, Sheila Kraft, and I'm a member of Naranon of uh, Monroe. And I came because uh, I was told that there was this meeting, which I think is awesome. And addiction, as you guys probably know, especially the uh, Wheaton from the Cocoon House, it's a family disease in that um, it affects the family. Okay, so the addict is affecting himself, but it can be devastating to find out you have a child who is addicted. Um, they're, whether they're going in and out of jail or whatever it is, um, in and out of treatment, which can be very expensive, um, or a, a family member or a close friend. So I wanted to let people know, especially parents, that there is um, a group for you, a support group. It's called NAR Anon, and uh, it's similar to Al Anon for AA. So NAR Anon, we're um, loosely affiliated with Narcotics Anonymous, and it's a place where you can come and talk about your hurt, uh, get support, and also find out things that are helpful and are not helpful to do uh, with an addicted uh, uh, loved one. So I have materials uh, with me, uh, brochures, and also a printout of all the meetings in Western Washington. So if anybody would like those, I'd be happy to connect with you after the meeting. And do you have a, uh, is there a website for? There is, and it's uh, naranon.org, I think, hold on. I just usually put in naranon into the quest, into the. Uh, yeah, www.nar-anon.org. Thank you. I have another question over here. I'm Julie, and I'm a parent here in Snohomish, and I thank you both for being here. I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about what's being done actively in Snohomish to help this issue. Sure. Uh, just recently, well, not recently, but for a while, uh, the city of Snohomish is seeing retail thefts spike. Uh, so, for instance, somebody would go into Kohl's, grab some stuff, take that item, maybe to Fred Meyers, return it, get a gift card, take that stuff, that money, uh, or that gift card, either trade it for uh, heroin, or take it somewhere that somebody's given them maybe money for that gift card, like 57 cents on the dollar or 80 cents on the dollar, and they're getting cash for that. Um, then they're taking that in return and, and uh, uh, buying their drugs. So what's happened is, unfortunately, Snohomish has gotten that issue and it's become a big issue and that's how the drug task force is starting to get involved. One thing that you guys need to know is the city of Snohomish, they are all deputies here. You contract with the sheriff's office and they all do a great job as proactive enforcement. I mean, not only are they responding to all the 911 calls that come in and all the different assists that they do to maybe uh, Sultan or Monroe or uh, Lake Stevens, they're answering 911 calls and then they're going out and physically doing enforcement, checking houses, checking drug houses and stuff when they can. So they really do a lot. And it's, you know, we have to abide by the laws that are set out there. We can't just, in the state of Washington, if there's a drug house, I can't just go sit in front of a drug house and stop the next person that comes out. You know, that's profiling, that's a pretext stop. And so we have to do other ways to investigate that. So we're here, we're doing stuff, we're involved. And uh, um, like I said, your police department here does a great job as being proactive in the community. So is that kind of answering your question? If you're asking if we're going around and talking to the homeless kids and finding out if they have a place to stay or dealing with the mentally ill, you know, their Compass Health and Everett, Everett just started a place on Broadway. So instead of dealing with some homeless person that's maybe got some type of mental issue and is using heroin, we just arrest him for trespassing and book him into jail. That doesn't help, because um, now the jail's stuck with the cost of treating them for their mental disorder and stuff. So, you know, we can use uh, Compass Health there as well. So, um, I think it's something that we're gonna start doing like we're doing in South County, helping more, trying to help come up with solutions, you know, for uh, facilities that they can get help, Catholic service, you know, community services, and that type of stuff, but all I can tell you is we're proactively doing enforcement in the city. Talk, talk me through the process. If uh, you arrest, if you get a call for a crime, uh, 
shoplifting and you, uh, you arrest the individual, a young person, and it is apparent that he is or she is doing this crime to feed a drug habit. Talk me through the process of what you do with that kid. So if we get a 911 call, someone's stealing, and we get to Coles in time or any other place, and we're able to stop them, and somebody says, yeah, that person, security officer, we arrest them, we find the product on them, it's, it's up to the deputy to decide. When I mean, we figure out who they are, we identify them, we figure out how old they are. Uh, is it a felony level case? Is it a gross misdemeanor case? Um, are we taking them to jail or not? Um, if they're under the influence, we don't know what they're under the influence of. We could ask them, they might tell us, yeah, I've recently used this or that. Um, but we don't have a process where we offer them a place at the cocoon house or um, you know, we could book them into jail, we could take them to Denny Youth Center. They may have a process there that you know, asks them about their addiction and stuff. Um, but unless they have marijuana or <coughs> heroin on them or something, we really don't know. Um, and we could release them and take their photograph, take their information, write up a report, send it off to the prosecutor's office or send it off to Danny Youth Center. Um, they could be homeless. Uh, maybe they're using their parents' address. So we, part of the investigation is trying to figure out who they are and that type of thing. Um, if they have heroin on them, then you know, it's up to the deputy to you know, either test it, field test it, see if it tests positive, and then book them into jail or release them and then refer the charges. So and, 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 and if they're not homeless and they, 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 are, uh, they do have an address and you contact their parents, how often are the parents surprised to hear that their child is using heroin? Well, I'm trying to think when I was back on patrol how many times. That doesn't happen very often with younger juvenile kids being on heroin, stealing right now. I think right now if you were to take an age limit of the kids or the people that are doing this stuff, you're probably looking at 19 to 25 year olds that are stealing. So they're adults, so we don't have to release them to their parents. So I think the last juvenile case I did was in Granite Falls, at, yeah, and it was somebody extracting THC out of marijuana. I can't think of the last juvenile offense that I had while working patrol uh, with heroin or meth or something like that. Then what most often is it the juvenile offense that you come across? Alcohol, marijuana, yeah, truancy, trespassing, yeah. And, and Bart, when, when a child, when a kid comes to you, what's, talk me through the process of, of dealing with, with this child. So um, I, I wanted to answer your kind of what we do. On, uh, so Cocoon House has what's called street advocates. And I work with the street advocates. The street advocates are in your neighborhood, in your high schools. Um, I think there's two designated for this specific area. And what they will do is they will um, go out to kids they see at the skate parks or kids they see at the streets. Or I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Stoner Trail or here in Snohomish, it's behind 7-Eleven there. So um, they'll go out into the Stoner Trail and talk to kids. And they will um, ask kids if they want help or if, they're, if, they're, if there's some need that they have. And the kids will, if the kids identify that they have a need for drug and alcohol help, then the advocate will contact me. And then I w then will meet with the, with the um, youth and uh, do an assessment and make a recommendation for, for some treatment. And, um, or if it isn't drug and alcohol help, if it's mental health help or um, housing help or uh, legal help, and a lot of times, that is uh, how kids do get in touch with me. They do end up in Denny Youth Center, and then uh, eventually get a probation officer, and then the probation officer will recommend, because of the um, youth has uh, had drug history, to meet with me. And that's a lot of times how I will um, get in contact with the kids through the day. Denny Youth Center actually has quite a few programs to help, help um, uh, kids that are affected by uh, drug addiction. Is it, it, is it is it funded fully enough? Huh? Is it funded fully enough? Do you have enough money? Um, I can't really speak to funding. No. <laughs> probably, oh, yeah, probably not. It's my experience. Social services isn't funded very well. But yeah, probably not. Do I have a question? We do. 
Yeah, um, I apologize, I got here late, so you probably went over this before I got here, but there, Detective, are you, is it a Snohomish County Drug Force or a city of Snohomish? Snohomish Regional, so it's okay. all of Snohomish County. Okay, um, I'm a mother of Monroe and I'm gonna be out of town next week, so that's why I came here, but I was wondering, kind of in addition to what you said, um, wondering more about um, proactive stuff that's being done. Um, there was a thing put on by the Monroe School District at the beginning of the year, and um, it was great. I, unfortunately, I didn't bring my 12-year-old because I didn't realize that, I mean, I thought it was an adult program, and it would have been great for him. Um, and I think education, the more information you give kids, the better. Um, so we're not too, um, you know, being proactive rather than, you know, reacting and then needing the treatment in the cocoon house and being homeless and everything. Is the, the regional drug task force, do they do anything like that? Put on programs for kids, like not just DARE and, you know, I can talk to my kids about it, but I'm just mom, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. Do they do anything like that? Yeah. So a couple years ago, what we started to do different of the task force, we sent out letters to all of the uh, schools in Stormish County say, hey, the drug task force like to offer this 30 minute drug awareness type thing. So we did a, we did a whole lot that year. And then it's kind of slowed down. Some of the most of the schools will have like in their health class, they'll talk about drugs and alcohol, tobacco and that type of thing. Right now, I currently work with just a couple schools at the sixth and seventh grade level. Um, but if anybody were to call and say, hey, Monroe High School, ninth graders, health class, they want to do something uh, for drug education, awareness, that type of thing, it would get sent back through the sheriff's officer through Monroe and could come to the drug task force. The city of Monroe, with that being their school up there, they could do that themselves. So I'm not really sure, but if they were to call and say, hey, do you put this on? We would definitely, that's something that I do. So like um, if I were to go to, let's say a Monroe middle school and talk to somebody there, I have a 45 minute presentation that we show. And you know, I. I talked to him about, you know, this is what it is, this is what people were doing, and this is what's out there. I'm not showing them how to use it, but I want them to know what it is and what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So if they're at a friend's house and somebody pulls something out and starts huffing on it and breathing in and says, hey, this is really good, it makes you feel good, they'll know that that's called huffing or inhaling. So we, you know, I teach them on three different drugs, heroin, marijuana, and we talk about maybe pills or huffing depending how much time we have. So as a task force, that's something that we do and we offer. Do I go out and solicit it all the time? No, because if I did, I would be so busy doing that and teaching in schools that I wouldn't be able to do drug enforcement at the street level and that type of thing. We're just, we don't have enough manpower to do that. But I would never turn something like that down. Post middle school in Arlington, I've been talking there for the past five years. And I think all the kids that are now into high school that have attended that school have heard my drug presentation there. Stanwood High School, a couple other places, Port Susan Middle School. So I have some certain places that people call me back. Cavalero Mid-High was one. Uh, but as the teachers change and that type of thing, again, I don't solicit. We just wait for them to call us. And, and Bart, what about um, Catholic Community Services and Cocoon House? We, yeah, uh, Catholic Community Services actually has a counselor out at Sultan right now, um, she works with the whole Sultan School District. I'm not, I'm not sure what connection they might have to the Monroe or Snohomish School. Um, I know that we do uh, work with uh, kids out of the schools, and if any of those schools request, like just like um, Detective Chatwood had said, any of those schools request uh, a presentation or have a, a, um, a thing that they're putting on that they want us to represent, we will definitely go there and that's part of my job too is outreach are there other questions in the audience um, well I'm grateful we've spoken about the youth and um, how to prevent this disease and what's happening um, I guess my question may be directed to you Bart um, I don't know if you can answer it or not my addict is not a youth and okay. did not start until later adulthood. And um, I also live in the city of Snohomish. And from what I've seen, um, it has a huge problem in the 19 to 35 years. 
And those are the kids and the people that the detective spoke of that are doing the robberies, the home robberies, right. the break-ins. Um, as a family, we've tried everything we can. Right. We are limited legally by what we can do. But as an addict, they're not in the right mind. Right. Why can't we commit them? Why can't I put her in a psychiatric facility? I, I think... Um, I've tried. <laughs> I She's think you'd have, to, you'd have to like, um, prove that they have to be harming themselves some way. If they're on heroin and she's using every day, obviously, yeah. she's harming herself. Yeah. Obviously, she's harming herself probably quite a right. bit. Um, I, How do we I feel for you because, because addiction is, is a horrible, horrible disease that um, it is very hard to understand. And a lot of people think it is very much like a, a light switch. You can turn it on and turn it off. I can't. I, if I could, I would have turned her switch off. <laughs> and so, so um, until the, uh, the person that's addicted has a, a, a desire to, to try to do something different or starts to value different things um, and seek out some help, nothing really um, can be done. It's, it's like... Even if they could get that mental help, mental health help, it, don't think that and, and, and I see what you're saying, um, that if you could get them just to, to go to the, um, I guess the best way I could put it is my experience, um, is if I put a puddle of water here, spilled some water, and I pushed on it, um, it would spread out. And that's kind of what it's like sometimes when you push on an attic. Um, the, yeah. the, the, their brain um, is the most affected part of their body, and, right. and they're going to protect that drug use, they, they, that drug use to them is survival. It's, right. it's been really base it animalistic instinct. Yeah, yeah, it's it, more it outweighs all. Breathing. It's, it's, a, it's a very much a, like a survival instinct. So a lot of times the best thing to do for an addict is to let them shoot themselves in the foot and let them. And when they don't, and, and when that's not enough. It's, that's the horrible thing about it. I, and there's, there's no real set way to address addiction. Like Can in, we change the law? Uh, I think that, that I think we're getting into an area of discussion that's a little bit off topic, so we want to bring it oh. back to the, the question of youth and drug use, and uh, that I think you have some very legitimate questions that need to be taken up at a much higher level than uh, what we have here. Go ahead. Yes. Please stand up. Hi, my name is uh, Philip. I live in Snohomish. Uh, my question's for the detective, probably. Um, I'm just curious, you, you started out talking about the, the two overdoses at the Sultan Library, and I'm just wondering, is there sort of like a good Samaritan law where if someone, has, their friend has drank too much or taken too many pills, that they can call 911 without, you know, getting themselves in trouble? And if, if that is the case, is the message out there that, hey, if if your friend's overdosing or whatever, you know, get help. Um, obviously, we want to keep the drugs out of the community, but if they slip through, you know, um, is the message out there that, you know, anyway, that's my question. So. That's, that's a good question. Uh, as law enforcement, we're not going to hold you liable for their overdose um, if you're supplying to them you know, providing a building, you went out and purchased it for them, they overdosed and, you know, maybe died or something happened, that's probably a different story. That's something the, you know, uh, the detectives and stuff would investigate and determine what happened. But if it was just, let's say it's a normal, somebody took too much, took a pill that they, you know, started to react from, um, yeah, calling 911, getting us there, getting the, the fire department there. I don't think you're going to be held liable for that. I don't know necessarily about the Good Samaritan part of it. Um, but it's not, like I said, most of the time we're not headed out to these things just to go grab somebody and take them to jail. You know, it's, it's about helping people. I mean, the deputies that work this area and work the officers that work this area, you know, uh, show a lot of compassion to a lot of people out there. And that's part of it, you know. Maybe that's what it takes to get somebody some help. You know, um, if you end up calling, you know, to get them help. Is that, did I answer your question? Actually, actually there is a Good Samaritan law, and, and we do go over that with the kids at our treatment center, and we do let them know um, when, when the kids are in treatment, we will let them know about that law and let them know that they will not be held accountable if they um, 
uh, call 911 if uh, they have a friend that's overdosing. We Question over here. here. Hi, my name is Rachel and um, my son's an addict and I feel your pain. Um, I guess my question would be, I read the article in the Tribune a couple weeks ago, and I think it was Detective Slack, maybe? He's a commander, yeah. Yes. Commander Slack. And the part that irritated me the worst is the statement that drugs are part of our economy, so we need to educate our kids on the evils of drugs. I get that. Why do we have to accept that they're part of our economy? Why can't we stop the heroin? Why do we have to say it's going to be here? It doesn't have to be here. I have, I printed Snohomish County Jail Registry today, just on a whim, I printed the K's because my son's best friend, who when they were 16, stole a car, drove it with my son in it, he broke his femur, that's where it all started. My son is in prison today, thank God, it's the best thing that could have happened, but he overdosed in the Jack in the Box parking lot here in town about a year ago, and I was told that I need to walk away, I need to leave him alone. I followed the ambulance as far as Bickford and I turned my car around and I went back and begged the police to go to the hospital and arrest him and take him to jail. They said there was nothing they could do. Um, he went the next step. Somebody else got hurt, which is, I'm sad, God saved them and they're gonna be okay. But why do we have to accept that it's part of our economy? Why do we have to accept that heroin's in Snohomish? These petty thefts, this young man has been in jail 30 times since he was 16. Why? That's my question, why? There's no consequences, and I don't know if it's our judicial system. My son went through drug court at Denny. Fantastic program. Are they funded well enough? No. They're the best thing that happened to him. They probably saved his life. He has overdosed probably four times and been brought back to life. Trip to the hospital in the ambulance, hit him with the Narcan, and he's good to go. Until they suffer real consequences, some of them will not quit. Well, let's, let's, let's put that question to the detective. What would have to happen <laughs> if the community wanted to say, no more heroin? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a big thing. I mean, I'm trying to think about what you're saying. If I responded to that call and he was overdosed, I'd start looking for paraphernalia. I'd start looking for stuff. If I don't see anything and he already used the needle and put it in him, maybe I could charge him with drug paraphernalia. But I can't charge... Okay, that's a difference, see? I mean, that's how we start investigating it and start figuring it out. Would I go up to jail or would I go to the the hospital with him, get a clear to book and book him into jail for that. It really depends what's going on at the time in the county. So I can't second guess about that. Um, as far as the community, yeah, the community needs to get together. They need to take a stand on drug houses, problem houses. Um, just because, you know, I've talked to multiple people about houses, just because people go to a flop house and party and stuff, it's not against the law, okay, to go to a house and party. So. It's not against the law to be poor. It's not against the law to be homeless. So, but the community needs to come together and through their block watch system, through working with the, the local police department or the sheriff's office if they're un unincorporated. They can go to the task force website, report suspicious activity, report people, provide information. Maybe that's something uh, that's gonna help us because if we didn't know about that specific vehicle at that specific house, that could be the dealer that we're looking for and the break that we're looking for. So people talking to each other and getting involved, yeah, that's how you take back your community, you know? We have uh, other questions here, here this evening. Uh, my name is Steve Strickler. I'm the Director of Juvenile Justice for Youth for Christ in King and Snohomish County and work specifically with the uh, Denny Juvenile Justice Center throughout probation, the drug courts, and actually work for a couple of the Superior Court judges in developing youth partnering and mentoring programs for the Offender Drug Court and the ARY Drug Court. And I feel your pain. I know your son. <laughs> I was there when he graduated. Um, there is no simple answer to this. And saying that, why, do, why can't it just not be here is is like putting blinders on. I mean, it's here. And um, what I would say, if you have family members that are between the ages of 12 and 19, 
the the offender drug court, which is a, a, a court that um, a juvenile will have actually committed a crime. And if you get him in that drug court, there are enormous resources available to help those kids. Um, the, the ARY drug court is not an offender drug court, so a kid that just has a, a, a drug problem, that process can be initiated by a parent or a legal guardian, and if the petition is approved, then the judge and the court becomes the parent or the guardian's partner in dealing with whatever's necessary, and then mandatory treatment can be assigned. Whereas, that's where a lot of the times there, there's not money. And we don't have one, correct me if I'm wrong, Bart, I don't think we have one treatment facility in the county. Maybe there's something in Mount Vernon, but most of the kids that, that we commit to, to treatment, they have to go to Yakima, they go to Spokane, they go to Vancouver, they go all over the place, yeah. but they don't inpatient. come here because of money. We just don't have the money. Yeah, there's and, no inpatient facility. There is a detox facilities, but as far as inpatient facilities, none in Sonoma But if, if you just go online, and you could actually um, um, do, do the web search for Snohomish County Reclaiming Futures, which is a change initiative in the county. I'm one of the board fellows on that council, on that committee. And we work with Superior Court and all the at-risk youth organizations that work with kids throughout the county. And there are a ton of resor resources that have become available there. And over the last couple of years, hundreds of hours has been sent, spent gathering that information. So you can go to that site and get some questions answered. Yeah. We have other questions, so yes. uh, it, please be patient as we move through the room and around the room, getting the microphone to you here. Um, please. I, I also, I'd like to say something. Um, actually, our Catholic Community Services at-risk youth representative is right here in the room. Her name is Becca Reed right there. So if you do have any questions about the at-risk youth program, Becca would be happy to answer those. Hi, my name's Linda, and my question's for Detective Chitwood. Yeah. Um, try not to cry now. Be strong. I know. Um, I lost my son last July, six, um, to heroin. How old? 34. Okay. On our property, he had an apartment, and uh, so many times we were, my husband and I were scared to check on him. We were scared he's gonna be dead. And the time he did die, we were shocked that it finally happened because we'd been scared of it for years. And I remember the first time, I know the first time he tried here when he came in the house and said, Mom, do you like me? I'm really mellow. I found a new drug I like. And I said, Jake, what, is it? what are you on? He said, don't worry, Mom, because he's bipolar. He's either up or down. I told him, no, I don't like you high like that. But he, he liked it, I don't know, but anyway, my question to you, Detective, is how many deaths to heroin in Snohomish were there in 2013, and how many deaths so far in 2014 has there been in Snohomish? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know that. I don't know the stats on that. I didn't run that. Um, I, know there, I know the overdoses are up. If they were, I would, I would imagine from last year uh, at this point. I don't know exactly, but I hear the calls when they come out on the screen that somebody's in the bathroom. Yeah. Somebody's possibly overdosed, somebody's shooting up, um, eight cars are en route, you know, that type of thing. So I would, I would say it's up, I, but I just don't have a number for you. And, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I was, but I I, would, it's definitely up. Okay. Yeah, because we've all told him, my, it's been hard on my, my husband, myself, my daughter, and my other son, and we all told him this isn't going to end good. Right. And he died on a Saturday, and he was going to go into rehab on Tuesday, and that's a problem. You right. have to wait a year. You have to wait months. Right. So when he was ready to go into rehab, we couldn't get him in rehab. Right. Then he dies. And we knew he was probably doing his last Yahoo or whatever before he went in. Yep. Kills you. Yep. Probably took way too much or something. Or, yeah. It was black tar it was black and it was pure. Yeah. My name is Mary D, and I'm a parish nurse in one of our congregations here in Snohomish. Um, I have been to the city council to talk to them about um, not opening a marijuana shop in our city. And by this fall in September, they will be making a decision. Several council uh, members are for opening a shop in our community. One of you suggested that uh, it seems that when 
we advocate for this, that it seems like we're normalizing the situation, and that's the way I see it as well. I feel that we are um, trying to make money on the backs of our children uh, by advocating for something like that in our community, even though it probably will not stop drugs, we still do not need to sell it in our community. Several areas have uh, decided not to do that, like Monroe, for instance, and I believe Marysville. So I'm hoping that all of you will uh, talk to the city council and go to the meetings and advocate that we don't do that. Uh, one thing, one problem I see you have as a police person and working in, the, in what you do is our media. Our media is actually supporting marijuana. I, I, when I turn on the television and watch the news, I see the program talking about the newest shop that's open. We now have a mother and, mother and son working together, uh, opening a shop on marijuana, and they're almost affirming did, did you have a question? That these are good. Did, did what I would have a question in is that um, the next thing I was going to say is that we have uh, several programs that are going to be discussing on how we blend marijuana into our food. And uh, how can we prevent, the, I know they smoke it, I'm a nurse, I know all about what they do with it, but how can, what can we do about keeping it from candy and cookies and, um, and then it, and the kids want to sell it on the playground. Uh, how can we keep that part of it from happening? Thank you, thank you. Uh, might be ab above you, your pay grade, but uh, if you'd like to take a uh, shot at answering that question, what can the community do? It, what role well, should the community take? Well, if the community doesn't want it in the city of Snohomish, where do you go? You go to a city council meeting, right? You burn up the phones, you burn up their emails, you let them know and make it clear that this community doesn't want it here, okay? How you do that, that's totally up to you, okay? And how often you do that, I don't mean to burn it up tonight and call your friends to do that, but what I mean is that's how you, you make a voice for yourself. As far as stopping it into edible items, that type of thing, the voters in the state of Washington approved it. It's not gonna stop, okay? You can stop it from your community here, but you're not gonna be able to stop it in all the communities, so it's gonna be around. As far as an edible shop or a taco, you know, like those little portable places that go around, maybe there's gonna be something in the city of Snohomish, you know, stops that from coming in and selling their product in the city. I'm not really sure. That's, again, over my head. As far as kids, under the age of 21, it's illegal. Okay, so edible items, if we were to go out to the park, if we were to stop kids, we can confiscate that stuff. If we know what's in it, obviously we gotta send it out and get it tested and do all that stuff. But, you know, that we can still do the enforcement end and take their stuff, okay? And then figure out where they're getting it and that type of thing. So it, it can be done, but if you don't want it here, I suggest going to the city council. Let me, let me bring this back to the, the focus of the forum here and, and ask both of you, uh, it's obvious that, that the, the beginning of the solution of the problem at any level is going to be in the home and with the parents being involved and knowing what's going on. So can you talk a little bit about what some of the signs parents should be looking for for beginning experimentation with drugs uh, by their kids? What, what, what should they be looking for? I think the uh, first thing to look for is a uh, change in friend, friend group. Um, change in behavior of any sort, change of behavior, sleep, sleep pattern, um, change in uh, eating habits, um, change in uh, how they talk, um, change in their school, their grades, uh, losing interest in things that they once had interest in. Um, I can tell you that the biggest protective factor uh, for youth in, in drugs and alcohol is the family and is also um, outside, uh, outside like uh, football or, or church groups or youth groups or um, just outside activities that the kid can do and that they're held accountable to. That's what I do for my, my children. And so um, I know those, those work well and they, they've been proven to uh, um, help in uh, keeping kids away from, from drugs and alcohol. Yeah, for me, the signs are 
as law enforcement, are you missing stuff in your house? Are things coming up missing or uh, checks being written that, you know, by your juvenile, by your somebody that's living there? Um, you know, what types of things are missing? What types of things aren't feeling right? Um, like he said, the language, the attitude, the uh, coming home at late, uh, smelling of smoke, anything like that, that you just know, listen, that's not right. Something's not right here. If that little hair on the back of your neck sticks up, you need to investigate it. You need yeah. to be hardcore. Do you have passwords to their cell phones? Do you have passwords to their Facebook account? You know, do you know what's going on? Do you know who they're talking to? Do they have Snapchat? Do they, you know, what, what are they doing? You know, we're the parent. We need to be involved. We need to know what they're doing. And that's how you try to police it. Does it always work? Not always, but it, it helps you to know what's going on. If we just turn the other way and not know what they're doing and allow them to stay out till 10, 11 o'clock at night or allow them to stay on the computer till 12, 3, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning and we don't know what's going on with their passwords and their Facebooks and that type of stuff, that's how they start you know, experimenting and taking the next step and going. So. And, and your response to, to the, the child saying, what, don't you trust me? Yeah. I trust you, but I want to know what you're doing. I want to make sure. I want to know who your friends are. I want to know what your friends are doing. Um, for instance, when I see certain things of certain kids commenting a certain way on something, I say something. And not only do I say something to would have been my kid, I would say something to them the next time I see them. So, but I'm thinking, and I'm talking from a cop, I'm a cop, and so I'm, I want to get involved and get right in somebody's face and talk about it and stuff. I don't want to, but uh, I think that's how you stay involved as a parent to, to see these signs and start asking questions and knowing what's going on and pull back the reins and, oh, you don't want to come home at 10 o'clock when I told you to come out at 10 o'clock? Then give me your iPhone for the next week. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, as we return to the basics here, a little bit about where the drugs are coming from? Are, are these drugs domestically provided or are they coming up from Los Angeles or in from New York? Yep, coming out of state, uh, like I said, cartels are bringing them in. Um, the task force is all around Washington, uh, DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, everybody's working hard and being proactive to stop the mid to upper level flow of it coming into the counties and coming in. And they're, you know, they're doing a good job. I see, I see the stuff that comes out of all the busts that they do and the, you know, the kilos, seven kilos, 10 kilos, you know, $500,000 here. Uh, you know, they're working hard and they're, they're doing it. We're get, but stuff gets through and we get the collateral damage from it. So, I have a, another question. My name's Gary. Um, one of the things that I would like to clarify, because we've covered multiple subjects tonight, that if the crime basically, and that was the purpose of the meeting, is, is being perpetrated from the 19 to 35 year olds that are adults that can make their own choices, one of the things that we can do is if you look at it as that person to support their habit is stealing but the parts that are in our control are all the people that are buying stolen items. Think about it, they're stealing your lawnmowers, they're stealing power tools, and if somebody pulls up in a pickup truck and wants to sell you a bunch of stuff for $5 a piece, it would be better to turn them in, it would be better to control it that way, but stop buying the stolen stuff. I mean, if, if you stop all the that source of it, they have no place to sell it. They made convert to something else, but it's, it's very important to know that that is something in our control. Um, one more thing, I, I have smoked pot since I'm 10 years old and I'm 60 years old. I have no desire to quit, I enjoy it, don't want to quit, but the point being is that if I had my kids, my 12 year old kids, which are all grown, came to me and said, Dad, I wanna go drinking tonight or I wanna go smoke pot, I'll tell them to go smoke pot all the time over the effects of alcohol and how extreme it is when people just drink and drink and drink and then they get behind the wheel. I wouldn't have any issue of people that smoke pot and drive cars. It's, it's a much smaller scale of the chance of that person getting in trouble versus the guy that drank the entire bottle of whiskey. Just, just to let people know that, that smoking pot is 
there are millions of people that smoke pot in this world accept it, but the things we can control is to stop the crime. Well, let me just put that to, the, the, to, the, the, to the detective there, Bob. Uh, the, so so we, don't, we don't know this yet, but reference your comment about somebody smoking and driving down the road versus drinking. Yeah, no, that's... Yeah, we, I, I'm just saying, we're going to see in Washington, just like Colorado, Colorado came out with stats from their Washington Traffic Safety, or from their Traffic Safety Commission, about their crime has gone down since legalizing marijuana. Crime in Colorado has gone down. DUI crashes have gone up. And we don't know those yet in the state of Washington, but we're going to see that probably as soon as Washington gets going here and everybody starts doing their thing, we will probably see statistically DUI crashes increase in the state of Washington. So I beg to differ about your opinion on that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can, uh, again, going back to the basics here this, this evening, can you talk a little bit about uh, pot and spice and ecstasy in, in terms of their effect on a, a child, uh, the, the, the responses and, and, and identifying those drug uses? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what it is and then you, you want to talk about the effects and what the kids, okay, so, so marijuana is a plant, it's a seed, so you grow it, right, you put it in soil, heat, room temperature, lights, and you grow it just like a plant. On the plant grows the buds. And on that bud, there's THC, it's a chemical, okay, a little crystal that grows. When you put it into a pipe, you light a match to it, smoke it like you would a cigarette, that chemical gets into your bloodstream, gets into your brain, releases all the dopamine and different things, and gives you the high. The spice, all that is, is a, a synthetic form of marijuana. So what they've done is they've taken this herb, they've sprayed some chemical on it, that's the th synthetic marijuana so it's a or s synthetic THC they've sprayed this chemical on there so when you smoke that spice substance that chemical when get into your body into your lungs and into your bloodstream gives you the similar effect as that of marijuana does it give you the same effect I don't know does it make you hallucinate a little bit more do some stranger things yes I believe so but th so does everybody get the difference so one's a chemical the other one's a plant that grows the THC, the crystalline substance that you ingest, right? Okay, you right. want to talk about that? So, um, with the spice, you're, uh, the problem with spice is, like you said, it's a chemical. So, whoever's making that chemical, the ingredients can be changed and altered. So, you're never going to get the same chemical, uh, you know, type of of uh, compounds from different types of spice. They sell all different types of it at the smoke shops right in town, right? And um, it's my experience that, no, uh, you know, I haven't heard of any, but um, I'm sure they're out there, that the kids that, that um, use the spice are usually kids that already have been exposed to marijuana and have smoked marijuana. And, uh, but I'm sure there's kids that'll, that'll um, get the spice and experiment with that first. But Every time I ask a kid about spice use, they almost inevitably tell me it sucked. Then I ask him, why would you keep doing it then? Because they always tell me they, they've vomited or they've gotten really hazy vision or hallucinated and they said they didn't really care for it. And I'll ask him why did they continue doing it and they, they'll say, I don't know. <laughs> it's easy to get. Is, is it addictive? It is very addictive, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it stimulates the, the brain in the same receptor sites as, as, in, as other drugs. It stimulates the, the brain. So, and and yeah. can I just ask, in terms of price, is, is spice more expensive than marijuana? What, what kind of a price? Cheaper, Cheaper yeah. yeah. Cheaper? I've never bought it, but I, I don't think it's very expensive. It's like $15, and you get like five grams. Any other questions? We have another question here. Thank you. My name is Gina, and I am the mother of an addict as well. And when we talk about what you should know, I think you should know about our children who are 30 years old and incarcerated. I have many letters here from my son in jail as we speak. Um, it seems like we need to begin to have conversations about our country and a different path. We have been we, we fail to look at the bigger picture in many ways in our country. If you take a look at Europe, they also have a drug problem there, but it's much less than America. 
And if you hone in on the Netherlands, they have a drug problem. But again, it's in the ratio, it's much, much less than America. And what have they done differently than we do here? And it's time to have that conversation about changing. I took some time before I came today hoping that we could have a conversation about how to change our country and its outlook and how to decriminalize the addict and how to criminalize the seller it's what they did in the Netherlands is they reduced the harm. They focused on the harm. And particularly, they reduced the demand of, for the dealer. So you, they aggressively see the dealer. They reduce the supply when the dealer doesn't have a business, of course. And then the authorities focus on the big guys the focus is on prevention, health care, and the user. And they have some odd ideas there that would be so far, it's such a stretch for us to even think about, but it's time to think about it. For one thing, they have what's called a user room there. It's odd to us. It's a room where an addict can go, and they're actually monitored, and they have clean, um, syringes. They're treated with methadone more aggressively there than here. There are needle exchange programs and they vaccinate them against um, hep hepatitis. It just seems like we, we keep going down the same path. Drug addiction is on the rise. My son did not go become a drug addict because of peer pressure. He wanted to feel normal and this made him feel normal and it just got deeper and deeper and deeper. Yes, education is great. We need to educate our children. We need to be in the schools and in the communities. But this mom has lost her child. I am losing mine. I expect a call any day. And I think it's time we switch the conversation. And I think that's an excellent place to bring this conversation to a close this evening because that's what we're starting to do, starting to have conversations about these issues conversations about these important topics that affect us and can only be solved by us. We can solve the problem if we have the community will to do it. So uh, what I'd like to do is just bring our, after, our evening to a con conclusion by giving each of the panelists uh, an opportunity for some final thoughts before we bring the program to a close. Um, Detective Chitwood. Yeah, I, I'd like to thank you guys for coming out. It's great. I was. I'm, I'm happy to see that the room's full. I'm happy to see you guys here and concerned and, and want to get involved. Um, at the, it, before you guys came in, I brought some pamphlets and stuff. I never know what people want. So there might be some stuff underneath the table there that's not on the table that I'm going to put back out for you. My business cards are here. My email address is here. The task force is a regional task force. We're here to work with the community, here to work for you guys and, and help you guys. So my job again is to help you so if there's something you need please feel free to send me an email and uh, I'd be more than happy to answer your questions or get something for you uh, that you guys need so you know thanks again so much Mr. Wheaton um, thanks yeah uh, I like to echo that sentiment because um, that's where I think it starts is in the community too as well and um, they, they do have harm reduction programs here in um, Snohomish County there is a needle exchange program in the city of Everett and um, there is, they are fighting for funding for um, a more aggressive methadone program, but that's also been, um, you know, caught up in the legislature. Suboxone so and, and well, methadone. It, it absolutely is, it absolutely is. But yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're working on harm reduction programs as well. Um, this, this county is anyways. Well, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And if you know someone who might benefit from a conversation of this type, please let them know that there will be another discussion of this nature, of an issue that matters, of this topic next Thursday at the Monroe Library. We'll be joined again by our panelists here this evening. So if you know someone, if you heard something of interest tonight and you think someone else might benefit, tell them about the forum next Thursday at 7 p.m. at the Monroe 
library. We've, we've come to the end of our allotted time, uh, and so if you have not yet done so, please take a moment to fill out the blue evaluation form. Uh, Snow Isle libraries would very much like to hear your thoughts and other suggestions as to how to improve these presentations and what other issues that matter uh, should be dealt with in community forums like this. I want to thank uh, Detective David Chitwood of the Sonomish Regional Drug and Gang Task Force and Bart Wheaton, Chemical Dependency Counselor, Catholic Community Services and Cocoon House for being here tonight and, and sharing their expertise. Civil discourse on issues that matter is how we get change happening. And I want to thank you for sharing your views on the topic of drugs. Uh, with us tonight and responding and asking your questions and I want to thank you for coming out I want to thank you for being part of the issues that matter and invite you to join us here at the Monroe Library next Thursday at 7 o'clock for the Snow Isle Library's Snow Isle Library Foundation issues that matter and if tonight's discussion has made you more curious take the time to explore in the library uh, using the resources of your community library and the community library's websites to find out more. And again, thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs>